Good morning, everyone. The presentation we're going to have right, near to, right now talks about community eligibility provision, or what we call the CEP program. So what we're going to talk about today is what is it? What is CEP exactly? How does it work? What do I have to do to participate as a district? Who can participate? Because there are parameters you have to follow in order to be able to participate in the CEP program. Community eligibility provision. This allows districts, it can be either the whole district, a group of schools within the district, some schools, all schools, different groups to participate. None of the children in CEP, yes, I know what the state does. None of the people in a normal CEP program would be charged for meals. To determine the free claiming percentages, because you're only gonna claim free or paid meals. Your free reimbursement rate is determined by the number of enrolled children in each school that are on the direct certification list. All meals are claimed either free or paid, depending on the claiming percentages, no student pays for a meal. So we're gonna get a little bit more in depth in this as we go along. So this is the um, Code of Federal Regulations that talks about what direct certification is. Those are children that are made eligible for the child nutrition program because they are listed on the SNAP, TANF, they're listed as a foster child, homeless child, migrant, you, they could also be runaway. They can be Head Start, but Head Start and runaway will typically come from the liaison within your district for those programs. Enrolled students. Students who are enrolled in and attend schools participating in the community eligibility provision and who have access to at least one meal service daily. It can be either breakfast or lunch. However, for a district group of schools to participate, they must offer both breakfast and lunch to be eligible to participate in CEP. Students who do not have access to either breakfast or lunch due to the times they are attending school would not be eligible in the count of enrolled students. So if you have pre-K students that come after lunch, that they are between breakfast and lunch, and they don't have access to a reimbursable breakfast or lunch, they are not counted as an enrolled student. Identified student percentage, ISP, is the number of students enrolled in a school identified as receiving free meal benefits because of being listed on the direct certification list. This year, the ISP must be at least 25% for an individual group of schools or entire LEA to participate in CA CEP. And this 25% is unrounded. That means if you do the math and you come up to 24.999%, you do not qualify to participate at whatever your group is in the CEP program. If you're grouping together the entire district, as long as the total is above 25% threshold, you can participate. And I'll show you an example in a little bit of one of the schools in a district doesn't qualify at 25, but with the grouping of everyone, it does. What's the LEA? That's the Local Education Authority. That's the district, that's the superintendent, that's the people running this program. In this case, for, for CEP, categorical eligibility means students not on the DC list, however, the head of, head of the Head Start or Liaison of Homeless has given you a list. A student with an application and a SNAP number and not on the direct cert list is not counted in the ISP determination. All right, how does this work? 
any LEA or school must have an identified student percentage of at least 25% as of May 1st of the school year prior to implementing the program. So for this year, April 1st, 2024 is the data that will be used to participate in school year 25. Students certified based on documentation of benefit receipt or categorical eligibility as described in 7 CFR Part 245. Those are the ones we've already mentioned that are you're going to count to get to your ISP. Now, all students, and this is part of the program anyway, all students living in the household receiving either SNAP or TANF benefits qualify as long as one child is DC eligible for SNAP or TANF. As always with the National School Lunch Program, SNAP and TANF benefits carry to other children living in that house. Foster, migrant, homeless, Head Start, those programs, the benefit does not carry to other children. Foster, migrant, homeless, Head Start is just that student and that student only. Claiming percentages, as I mentioned, USDA changed the qualifier from 40% to 25%. This means that a group of schools, district, whatever you wanna to decide to do, if they get an ISP of 25% or higher, unrounded, can participate. As of April 1st of the preceding year, you can plan to begin operating CEP. So as I mentioned, if you want to look at the eligibility, the possibility to participate in CEP beginning in school year 2025, the data that we're going to use to certify you is as of April 1st, 2024, two months away. Yeah, roughly two months. Just a few benefits. Increased access to school meals, high poverty areas. Children don't pay for meals. They don't anyway. You do not collect for the four years you're participating in CEP child nutrition applications. Eliminates the administrative burden of verification. Reduces the chance of overt identification. You can use just a checklist to claim the meals. You don't need to list Tommy ate, Betty ate, Susie ate today. One, two, three, four, five kids, 10 kids, 100 kids, ate lunch today. After you determine your ISP, that is multiplied by 1.6 to determine your free reimbursement claiming percentage. That is intended to bring in the other students, reduced students, families that do not receive direct CERT benefits but fill out an income-based application, the 1.6 multiplier is intended to bring those additional students into the overall program and count. Things to think about, potential issues surrounding the absence of the application data. You're not gonna have the application to use for all of these other sources that currently use it. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is anticipated to increase the level of federal reimbursement. If you're going to run this program, the other money, most child nutrition programs in the state of Maine are not self-supporting. So you have to make sure, as you did in the past, the district will fund the remainder. You're going to be getting more money. But if you still are not profitable, do not break even, you will have to have other sources to make sure the program is running to break even. If selecting to participate in CEP, no child nutrition benefits are collected for four years. If you're going to participate in CEP, contact all the schools, go through their files, throw out any blank applications they have. If we hear that a school district is sending out and collecting applications, that tells us you are not participating 
and CEP. As I mentioned, you must also offer breakfast and lunch. It's not an or, it's an and, breakfast and lunch. And as I mentioned, a student must be eligible to participate in one of these feeding programs be counted in the enrollment. Meal accountability is simpler. You can use a tick clicker, you can use a tick sheet. If you're more comfortable, you can continue to use the computer to get a count. If you also feel you wanna make sure everything's okay, no one's getting a second meal, you've got a computer, you can still use an accountability by name. Just make sure it's not charging the students so all of a sudden at the end of the month, the family's gonna get a bill for $50 that they don't owe. CEP claiming percentage, identified student percentage, ISP, multiplied by the factor of 1.6. Those are the meals that you're going to claim at the free rate. The remaining percentage of total meals is reimbursed at the federal paid rate. State of Maine currently, State of Maine has legislation that they will be and will continue to pay the difference between free and paid federal reimbursement. Any meal cost in excess of that must be funded by the district. All right, so here's how it's calculated. A school, for instance, has an enrolled students of 374. The directly certified eligible students is determined to be 213. 213 divided by 374 gives you an ISP of 59 Point six five percent When determining your free claiming percentage after the eligibility number, you're going to use a two-point decimal place. So in this case, 596519 rounds to 59.65%. That is your ISP. The ISP is then multiplied by 1.6 to determine your free claiming percentage. The remaining 8.88%, that is your paid claiming. When calculating the number of free meal, free and paid meals to claim, if the total does not equal the total number of meals served, always round up or down the paid meals. So in this instance, 1,000 meals were served. Free claiming is 57.45, that, 57.55, sorry, sorry. So that means 575.5 meals are free. Standard rounding, that makes it 576. The paid claiming I got to redo this. My math is wrong. I'll fix this. But you would round up or down the paid meal eligibility. All right, so here's an example of what I mentioned before. There are three schools in the district, the Bedrock Community School District. The Rumble School has 374 students. 213 are on the direct cert list. They have an ISP of 56.95. The Flintstone Middle School has an enrollment of 258, directly CERT of 43.8%. However, the Bedrock High School has 313 students, but only 20, 75 are on the direct CERT list. Their ISP is 23.96. So in this example, as a standalone entity, the Bedrock High School does not qualify. However, the total for the Bedrock Community School District is 945 students, 401 directly certified. That gives you an ISP of 42.43%. The district, including all three of these schools, can participate in the CEP program. Procedures, documentations, LEAs intending to select CEP for some or all schools must. The superintendent must submit to me, david.hartley at maine.gov, by June 30th of the year prior to starting 
So this year, by June 30th, 2024, that they plan to participate in the CEP program. That email needs to list all of the schools that are participating. Do not say district Y. I need to know the names of all the schools that are participating. I will return an agreement to be signed by the superintendent. The superintendent signs the agreement, sends it back to me. The director of the child nutrition program will sign it and will send it back to you in the completed agreement to participate. By June 30th of the year prior to starting, the data must be submitted to be reviewed to determine the ISP. Documents submitted to validate the percentage will be done in CNP web because the master list and the things you send is confidential data. Don't just send an email. Upload it into CNP web, which is a secure data program. So you would log into your district Select 2024, your district. And then at the top left, you'll see one of the options you could select is e-reviews. After that, you're going to select other process because that's what this is. This is not an administrator review. You'll select other process. After you do that, you will see to the far right that little blue box with a folder in it. You're going to click on that. And then next, you'll see where you can upload the data. Select Upload, find the data, and submit it. When you are submitting your data, please name it what it is. Don't leave the number that was created when you, if you scan something, identify what the document is. This is my enrollment. This is my DC list. This is my Head Start list. This is whatever it is. Don't just whatever name popped up to it. As mentioned, it must be submitted by June 30th of the prior year. Everything has to be dated. Your direct cert list has to be dated. Your enrollment must be dated. Any documents you receive from a liaison within the district must be dated as of April 1st of that year. And all of this data will be used to determine your ISP. Enrollment, please upload your enrollment in Excel. Do not do PDF, do not do Google Docs. I cannot use Google Docs. I need to be able to use Excel formulas to make the determination. The enrollment must include it all of the enrolled students, not just those qualifying. If there are 250 children enrolled in that school, I want a list of 250 names. Identify the students eligible and the reason. Are they DC, SNAP, TANF, migrant, homeless, Head Start, whatever it is. For students on the DC list, what is the reason? Are they SNAP, TANF, foster homeless migrant? The list of the Head Start students from the Head Start program. The school the student attends. If you send me a master list of all 1,000 students in the district, I wanna know what students are in what school because the determination, even though that it is overall, we have to know each individual school's ISPs. If you have students living in a household with another student that is on the direct cert list, Tommy is on the direct cert list. In that household, Susie also lives. When you put their name next to their name on your enrollment, put their address so that I can see that family connection and include both students in the ISP determination. You must keep copies of everything you submit to me because it can be requested to be reviewed during any administrative review in the four-year period. So make sure whatever you submit, you're keeping and have access to. Your enrollment, 
Here's an example. We've got the school, a couple of different schools in the district. Um, Bartholomew Cruz is free, but he's from an application, so he's not going to count. Alex Rendardo, he's on the direct cert list, and I've got his address, because also in that household is Bobby Smith. He's got a direct cert family connection, so Bobby's address is on here, and Alexa's address is on here, so that I know they're both getting benefits because of the direct certification list. Direct certification list, date of the download. I need, as I mentioned earlier, everything has to have a date as of April 1st of the school year prior to implementing the program. The state agency must review documentation submitted by the LEA to ensure the LEA school meets the minimum identified student percentage participates in both lunch and breakfast, has a record of administering the meal program in accordance with program regulations. Reviewing the DC list annually, schools participating in a special provision, for instance, CEP, they still are required to access the direct cert list at least once a year and notify those families on the list that they are eligible for free meal benefits because of the direct cert list. Those families are gonna use that information for other reasons. So that has to happen at least once a year, do it at the beginning of the year, notify the families that they're eligible. For your purpose, you're not using that data, but that family might want that data for a different purpose. That must be done at least once a year. It's recommended you do it three times a year just to see if there are changes. Public notification. If you are going to participate in the community eligibility provision, you must notify the families in the district of that participation. We have a sample media release on the child nutrition webpage. There's more information online. You can find it at the main child nutrition webpage. You'll select programs, scroll down to the lunch program, and the first option at the top when you scroll down to the, to the selection bars, the first one is special provisions. And that might be able to help you with other questions you have. No longer wish to use CEP. If you're in the middle of the school year at any point, uh, this is not a you're locked in for four year agreement. You can decide to drop out of this at any time, in the middle of the year, at the change of the year, whatever you want. Participation is a local decision. If a school drops the CEP mid year, the district has 30 days to collect and process applications and complete the verification process. If you are going to decide to drop the CEP program participation, david.hartley at maine.gov must be notified that you're dropping out and when you're dropping out. If a district decides to drop out, it is strongly recommended that that change is done with the beginning of the next school year. That way you're not in a rush and a hurry to get applications out, to collect applications, to process them, because in 30 days, you're going to be claiming meals based on the student's eligibility status. Medicare expansion. The state of Maine has decided to participate in the Medicare expansion grant starting in school year 2025, starting. This means students that receive Medicare would be included on the direct cert list listed as either Medicare free or Medicare reduced. Schools may want to requalify for CEP after, June th after July 1st when the 
ISP would go up because you now have Medicare free students that can count in your ISP. Medicare reduced does not count. And we'll have different abbreviations on the top of the direct cert list like we have now for the other programs. I'm not sure what they'll be at this point in time, but we'll make the announcement when it's decided and when it becomes active. Why would you want to participate with the inclusion of Medicare expansion? With those students, it might bring you up to enough to qualify a district for a summer feeding program. Might qualify a district for CACFP after school. These are all things that can help the district in other areas. It would also help to increase the funding from USDA from reimbursable meals, because including the Medicare free students is going to give you a higher ISP and thereby give you a higher free claiming percentage. I've given you folks a lot of information in the past 25 minutes. So at this point in time, do you have any questions? No questions? If you have questions, put in the Q&A box, please. Okay, let's see. Questions, questions. Ah. I would like to know how to figure out my current ISP. Do all that data right now. Go to the direct cert list. Find out what it shows. Take your enrollment, compare it, and see what you're at right now. In At April 30th, I'll be posting something, or April 1st, within a couple of days, I'll be posting on our website a list of schools that are potentially eligible for CEP based on what's called proxy data. I'll have an enrollment number from the Department of Education. I'll have, I'll have a directly certified list of name, numbers and names from the Department of Health and Human Services that I get from the department, but that's called proxy data because it's not real. It's gonna be close, but it's not gonna be the actual numbers. If you want to see if you potentially qualify, do what I just talked about now. If you come up to 20.20%, 20 you're not going to make it. But if you come up to 24.8, maybe you do a little bit more digging. You try to find enough kids to bring you up to the 25% district-wide. Make sure you're doing the data matches for families living together. Try to grab everyone you can. Will we still be able to collect economically disadvantaged forms if we elect to go with CEP? Yes, you can collect the economically disadvantaged form. That is not the child nutrition form. That does not mean anything for the child nutrition program. But there are other programs using that data. During the years that you participate in CEP, no child in your district has an eligibility status because your percentage has been determined by the direct cert list, but you're not claiming anyone based on that. You're claiming them based on a free claiming percentage. Tommy, Betty, and Susie, even if Tommy and Betty are on the direct cert list, they technically do not have free, quali free qualifying status in the child nutrition program. Are we done? Give it another minute, see if anyone decides to hop on with another one. If after we're over this, you talk about it and you have questions about what we've talked about today, you missed something, you have additional questions, 
you can either send me an email at the email we showed on there, david.hartley at maine.gov, or give me a call at 624-6878. If I am not there, I'll answer that question as soon as I can. I'll call you if you leave a message. I'm not just going to ignore it. I will respond at my first availability to any questions I receive. Have we received any new questions? At that point then, ladies and gentlemen, I will say thank you for attending. I hope you've learned something from this. And remember, if you have any further questions, ask. I will answer.